Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, we are here, as always, on every Thursday, every Friday. My good friend, Giraffneck Mark, always in the building, um, teaching me the ins and outs of YouTube. Um, and we talked about it last time, but we didn't, we didn't actually make note of it. Um, you, that last episode was the first time we didn't have a glitch in it. We didn't have a phone go off. We didn't have my email go off, which, by the way, make sure that I don't have that going on right now. Yeah, check my phone. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Um, and uh, so, yeah, hey, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, but let's talk uh, your beloved Mets. I don't even want to talk about the Red Sox. Yeah, that's a bit of a mess right now. No, the Red Sox are, let's see here, we got a record of 6-12. and 12. Worst team in the American League. Worst team in the American League and only <laughs> competing with the Pittsburgh Pirates, who yeah. is coincidentally another team I played for. Oh, right. um, they're 3-13. and 13. So, it's, it's whatever. Red Sox are done. Uh, but your Mets, yes. uh, we've had a lot of injuries. Just a few. Just a few. We've had, you know, some especially particularly in the pitching staff, which also seems to be a trend for you guys. Yeah. But a non-injury question and a topic that, you know, was obviously very talked about in the past week, your good friend, Marcus Strum. Yeah. Did this have anything to do with, with the current health situation that you have with, with the calf or was this strictly um, just, just worries about COVID? Strictly worries about COVID. My calf, I'm back 200%. Um, I threw five innings, 85 pitches in my last sim game. Felt really good. Um, I've been working extremely hard with the staff uh, these past few weeks to, to get back out on the field. So um, this is not something that I wanted. This was a collective decision from my family for our best interests because I'm such a competitor. Um, it was incredibly hard to, to finally come up with this decision. Yeah, uh, yeah he opts out. Uh, this season and it was interesting timing because he happened to get enough service time to count towards another year he becomes a free agent at the end of the year let's hear your thoughts on this yeah so I can't blame Stroman for opting out I'm never going to give any player any sort of crap this year for opting out because I understand the reasons but it is a little convenient that you know he went down with this mysterious calf injury where he couldn't run but he could pitch still and he hadn't slowed down pitching at all um, he, like you said, he got the service time that he needed and then he kind of just said, all right, yeah, coronavirus, I'm out. Especially when he's a guy that you've also seen, you know, going to little league games and kind of being out in the public where it's like, okay, well, if coronavirus really is a concern, why are you going out and doing all this other stuff? Especially when it was almost like at the height of coronavirus. So, um, you know, I'm not going to look too much into it. I'm not going to take it personally or anything like that. Stroman did what he had to. Is it frustrating as a Mets fan? Yes. Is it annoying to see a guy who, you know, talks a big game and then ended up really doing nothing for us? Of course. But what, what am I going to do really at the end of the day? Like I can't call a guy out for opting out of coronavirus when it is a serious thing. Yeah. And I think uh, I want to make one thing obviously clear, at least on my end. And I know you feel the same way. You know, we understand the business aspect of baseball. Yeah. We understand that teams do this every year, the high, high tier prospects, they hold them back for, you know, a couple weeks. So they, they can't count this year as a service year. We, we at that. And we understand that Marcus um, does what he does business. wise It was a savvy business move. Honestly. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, get that service time so you can hit free agency and get paid. 100%. Yeah. Savvy business move. Uh, and he would have been dumb not to do if he was playing on opting out the whole time. Uh, he, especially with this injury, it, it would be dumb if everything was truthful yeah. They'd be dumb not to do what he did. Um, however, uh, we talked about, like I said, now there's a little more and a few other things surrounding this type of thing than in normal years. We have him being very pu- a very public figure, doing his own brand, which again, I, I have nothing, no, no qualms about it all. Yep. But he's, he's been out in the public. You know, now what, you know, it it's kind of doesn't add up there about the, the concern for the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, was this injury as bad as he made it out to be? Yeah, he, because he opted out immediately once he hit the service time, you know, you know, barrier or whatever. So was this even really an injury or did he just not want to play this year, but he wanted to make sure that he got the service time year and then opts out. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it doesn't, if you look into the, all the facts here, it doesn't look great on Marcus doing this. No, it's, uh, I think it's for his hometown team. Yeah. It's bad optics for sure. Especially because, yeah. like, you do have a fan base in the Mets that is, like, so we'll, you know, ride or die with you. And it just seemed like it kind of just said, eh, this was never my plan to play this year. Yes. I mean, it'd, be, it'd be completely one thing if he played the first couple months to get to the service time yeah. and then stopped. 
yeah. and was like, Hey, listen, I just really want to get my service time. So I get, you know, free agency next year, but I really don't feel comfortable about this. Yeah. Um, and I was willing to risk it for a month of playing, but I want to hold back now. I, I, I think everyone would be on board with that. hundred percent. Yeah. But now we're, we're calling to question his injury. Now there's so much more that goes into it now that just makes things not look great uh, for him. And it, it, I'm sure it'll play a role somewhat into free agency this year. Yeah, I think something to keep an eye out for, for sure. Yeah, would, would, as a Mets fan, would you welcome him back with open arms? Um, I, under, like, I was under the impression that he wasn't coming back anyway this year just because okay. knowing the personality and the chip on the shoulder that he does have, I don't think the Mets would be giving him the money that he would be interested in. I think he's probably going to want close to like $20 million plus a year, and I just don't see the Mets offering him that when they didn't give it to Zach Wheeler, who in my eyes is a much better pitcher and at least has a higher ceiling. Mm-hmm. So I just don't see the Mets giving him the kind of money that he wants, and there is going to be a team somewhere I think that will, in theory, overvalue him, so he'll go there. I, I think he'll follow the money. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there will be a team that, uh, that overvalues him, um, especially with his social media presence. Yeah. I think he gets, you know, again, remember these, these owners are businessmen. So and they're savvy enough to know that his social media presence brings in dollars for the team as well. He's so marketable. So marketable. You know, he, lots of young fans love him. Lots of guys will follow him to his new team. They'll buy the Marcus Stroman Dodger jersey, let's just say. Yeah. You know, they'll follow him. So they understand that there is value there with him. And he's definitely willing to do things that other players wouldn't be as far as social media is concerned. 100%. So there's value there. So there's he might get a bigger contract than we anticipate on the baseball field, but that's probably added in slash definitely added in to why they would end up giving him that or whatever the you know, other team ends up giving it to him. I don't know if there's been anyone talking about him. Yeah. I don't know, um, I don't know who needs starting pitching going into next year. I haven't followed it enough yet, um, but you're looking for 20 million a year. You know, you're looking for a contender. No one's paying that. That's not a legitimate contender and has deep pockets. Yeah, and that's just – I mean, even if the Mets do get the new ownership, I don't see – with the guys that will be available on the market, why would you spend that $20 million on Stroman and not spend that $20 million and then whatever, the extra 10 to go get a Trevor Bauer or somebody like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, and yeah, you might as well. If you're going, if you're actually going to contend – Yeah. Uh, and Trevor Bauer's, I mean, if we're talking social media, it's an equally yeah. as, as active, probably more so – active and in, in making his own brand and Trevor Bauer does his own stuff over in, you know, Cleveland, where is he? Cincinnati. Cincinnati now. Yeah. Cincinnati, yeah. Which is another team that's, you know, according to my thing, well, oh, they're not doing as good as I thought they were. They're, they've but been hot though. They've been hot. Yeah. Uh, yeah they, you know, they have been doing well, but here's a question I wanted to talk to you about. I was just going over the, this, you know, the standings here before, and I just always like to look at run differential mm-hmm. because, you know, a lot of times it shows, you know, maybe who the, who a better team is. Maybe the record doesn't quite show. Maybe they had a couple of tough yes. losses. But they're when they're winning, they're winning big. Yeah. Um, and the Dodgers, which is not surprising, they have the biggest run differential in the league. Yeah, no, yeah. But the Dodgers have a run differential of 42. That's a lot. I didn't realize it was that high. The, the Rockies, who are first place in their division, ha- has a 22 run di- differential. Yeah, it's a huge margin of difference. It's 20 plus runs. Yes. And you talk about the Yankees, or, you know, another phenomenal offensive team. Yep. 20 is their yeah. number. And then the closest team in baseball to them is Minnesota, who's talked about as one of, also one of the best offenses yeah. in the league. And they're nine back. They're 33. Dang. Yeah, that's still a lot. When I was scrolling through this and I saw 33 from the Twins, I was like, damn, they got to be winning by a landslide. You would think, yeah. And they're they're getting crushed by the, by the Dodgers right now. Yeah, Dodgers are just like another – they're a different kind of beast. I mean, like we knew they were going to be good. There was no doubts about that. But they've – and they haven't even really played well, I would think. So, like, and they're not even in first place in their division. No, it's 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 mind boggling that you can have that kind of run differential and not be first place in your own division. Let alone, I, I assume you're the best team in the National League. Yeah. Let alone in the National League West. Like you're, you know, this is this is outrage. Do they just have? You know, I haven't watched a lot of Dodger games, but do they just have you know certain pitchers in their in their rotation that's obviously sh- tremendous pitchers that are just keeping teams low, and then other pitchers that just suck? Yeah, I think what their the key has been that their losses have been close losses, and when they've been winning for the majority of the time, they've just been coming out and just dominating. Just absolutely dominating. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was just something that I happened to come across that I just couldn't believe, especially this early in the season. You know, we're you know, the Dodgers have played 19 games. Yeah. And we're, we, they've, it's, you know, 42 runs to have scored is a lot of runs. I mean, 19 it's, games. 
It's still a lot but, of people. But yeah, you, score. St- you still probably have a couple teams in Major League Baseball who their run differential, the Dodgers, might be more than they scored runs. Because I was looking back at it, like I was trying to do some power rankings recently, yeah. which is like so hard this year with the Orioles and Tigers being like good, which is weird. <laughs> but then you look at like their runs scored and runs, and it's like, wow, they're just kind of pitching well. That's it. Like they're not scoring any runs. No. But as always with this, Mark, I know I told you I wouldn't talk about the Red Sox today. Yes. But as always, always with this, I always find a way to circle back for a positive for gotta, my Red gotta Sox. Got to get them in. Got to get them in somehow. Got to get them in. The Red Sox have an 18, have negative 18, obviously negative. I don't mm. say that. Negative 18, it's not, it's not that bad. Is that, well, who's the worst in the league? Let me take a look. I mean, Seattle's like, 35. Yeah, which is what you expect. Yeah. Seattle's 35, Pittsburgh's 30. San Francisco, 29. Those I mean, yeah, the- they're, they're sitting at negative 18 with the Mets. So, like. Are the Mets 18, too? Yeah, Mets oh, are yeah, negative yeah. 18, too. And they're, I mean, you can honestly say now, like, they're actually playing the same teams, basically. So. Essentially, yeah. Yeah, so, team. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, the Red Sox pitching is bad as it's been. I think it's probably more, their run differential is probably more of a testament to their hitting than their I, pitching is pitching well. I couldn't agree more. We just let go one of my, one of my dear friends in Boston, in Brian Johnson, they, they yeah, let so him go. That. I can't believe they let him go. Well, it's because they were just keeping him at the alternate site, right? And like, oh yeah, some... he just he just peaced. Um, yeah. I, I I talked to the guy a little bit. I won't give away too much because he gets a little you know weird when I tell talk about him on on you know on the air or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know they they had no plans for him. They wanted to move on, and it was such an odd situation. You know, he's a homegrown guy. This is this is a class. It's just like Mookie, homegrown yeah. guy. You know, wants. I mean, obviously my, Brian wasn't asking for you know, 35 million a no. year, <laughs> but homegrown guy, you have possibly one of the worst pitching staffs in baseball. Yeah. And it's not like I'm seeing guys here that come up and I'm like, Oh, this guy is a prospect. He's still mid nineties. Just hasn't quite figured it out yet. Still a young guy. I'm seeing run of the mill lefties go yeah. out there and throw the baseball. And you know, you've got a guy here who's won big league games can, can be, you know, is cheap for the club still, why are we just letting this guy rot and, you know, run away? I mean, it someone's going to pick him up. Yeah. It was bizarre. Like to see that he didn't even get a shot this year, considering sure. like we've said, like the guys that have been thrown out there, like not to, you know, give any crap to those guys, but like they haven't performed no. and they've been throwing, they've been doing like it's throwing stuff at the wall, but they, for some reason they won't throw Brian Johnson at the wall. It seems like. I know it's honestly, it's, it's crazy to me. And again, nothing against those pitchers, but, you know, you haven't performed at any capacity right now. Yeah. Um, and again, we're not talking about high end prospects that haven't performed. We're talking no, about, fun. you know, regular guys that are, you know, just like Brian, you know, back of the rotation guys, if that probably more in the bullpen, if they're serviceable at all. And it's, it's embarrassing, honestly, to see this team just give up so easily uh, on a, on a squad that has such a good offense. Like if I'm on that, if I'm a part of that offense, I am so frustrated this year. Well, haven't they been – I've been hearing stuff that apparently the offense, the hitters are getting frustrated that basically like, we got to come back every single night. Like this I, is getting annoying. I remember in the first couple nights, I think maybe Mitch Moreland or someone had said um, – oh, who was the guy we got from the – oh, Pilar. Yeah. He had come out and said something like, you know, we, we got we to gotta be better than this. And yeah. he didn't talk about the offense really. He just talked about the pitching. And that's obviously not great. You don't want to no, say it in the media. But the same token, I understand the frustration – because, you know, it's a great offense. You're not really even giving them a chance to win. No. Because, I mean, you guys score like five or six runs a night sometimes and you still lose. Like, that shouldn't happen. I mean, and we, we'll be we split with you guys, right? And yeah. Two, you guys too. And you know, Mets, is a good, Mets are a good team. Yeah. We're not talking – you know, we're not, I'm not, we're not splitting with Seattle. No. You know, we're splitting, or, with, you know? splitting with a team that should be a playoff team in theory. Yeah. And, and, only, and, and we, we, we played against – pitched against DeGrom. We beat DeGrom. Yep. You know, we didn't, it's not like we just beat, you know, your, we actually lost to your back end. Yeah, spot. you did. <laughs> lost to Waka and Peterson, but. Yes. I mean, Waka's still really good. I thought that yeah. was good. But it is, it is, I, I know, listen, I, I couldn't believe it. But, you know, we want, the, the way I want to talk, uh, the other team I want to talk about here that's very important is the Chicago White Sox. Mm-hmm. I think a very, a vastly underperforming team. Am I wrong yeah. on that? I mean, they're 10 and I 9. Think- I think that's what we're going to see from them, though, is I think you're going to see, like, because they did have a hot streak, I think, where they won, like, I don't know, four out of their last six or something like that at one point. They're, and then win they, two, win, uh, they're winning two in a row right now. Yeah, so then I think that's just what's going to – it's going to be peaks and valleys with them, like, so young. Their pitching is super inconsistent. Um, the offense is always going to be there. I mean, Luis Robert has 
really helped them out a ton, along with Mancada and Encarnacion and Grandal. I mean, that lineup's just absolutely loaded. But I think their pitching is going to be, you know, the downfall for them, as always. But that was a team, like, I visited in spring training. They were having a lot of fun, like, having now been inside, like, you know, locker rooms and stuff or clubhouses for major league teams – you start to get a feel of like what guys actually like each other and like what's like good chemistry going on there. And I loved like the feel that the White Sox had. So I was like, this is a team that at least is going to play hard every single game. That's going to want to try to win every single game. Like I, and they have good players. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a believer in them. I had them in the playoffs before even the expanded playoffs. So. Yeah. I mean, they're third in the division right now behind Detroit. I don't think anyone thinks Detroit's going to stay there. No, that um, has to stop soon. <laughs> yeah. Minnesota is going to win the division. Definitely. But, I mean, they have a 30 plus 33 run differential. Cleveland, who's tied for, with Chicago, has a plus 11. Chicago's got a negative one, and Detroit's got a negative two. Yeah. So it's a kind of a weird, um, weird division. Uh, but what it brings me to my next and final point with you, Mark, and I've always wondered what your thought process on this since I've been following you for a little while now. Sure. Is the Chicago White Sox probably yes. their most electrifying player is Tim Anderson? Yeah. Now I can tell you when I pitch against Tim Anderson, I, I, it, he was so frustrating to pitch against because he's a first pitch swinger who has pop. Yeah. Those guys are you know, the worst because yeah. you, you know, usually first pitch swingers are guys that are just trying to fillet the ball somewhere, trying to get a single. They're, they're, you know, they're small ball guys and I can, I can handle a single, but you know, first pitch of the game. I remember in high a baseball, I was playing for the Salem Red Sox th- first pitch of a game home run. Yeah. And it's like the most, <laughs> the most nauseating things you're immediately your your outings immediately shit now well because it's so, almost like you get into that rhythm right like i mean like you, the amount of times you've seen a baseball game where the guy just comes out there just throws like a you know 95 mile an hour fast right down the middle all right we got the game started now we're ready to play exactly right? you know yeah. let, let's get into the groove of the game yeah but i won't i won't dive too much in his first pitches but obviously he's been thrown out several times i actually asked when i was in minnesota if my coach wanted me to throw at him yeah. Um, because yeah, he pimped a home run in the beginning of the game and, uh, it was not seen, uh, the twins were horrible that mm-hmm. year and it was not seen as a meaningful moment or anything like that, where you, your, your, ex, your emotions should be elevated or anything like that. So it just seemed really disrespectful, which yeah. is where I kind of stand on that, in that, that, that side of the game. And, uh, we ended up throwing at him later, but where do you, where do you stand on pimping home runs? So I love it, but I think there's a time and place for it. So like, I mean, if the Mets were a last place team and you know, you're down five and you pimp a home run, like, what are you doing? Like you're you're getting your ass kicked and you guys aren't a competitive team, like take it easy. And I know that's the big, like, uh, you know, criticism of Tim Anderson is that he'll do it all the time, but I'll give him credit. If he does it all the time, then isn't it almost like not as disrespectful because he's not showing you up. That's just what he does. So that's, that's fair. That's yeah. very fair. If you do, if you do it all the time, it it it, do, it does come off less disrespectful. Yeah, because it's just kind of who you are now. Yeah, and I, I I love Tim Anderson. Like I met him this spring training. Super nice guy. He like has a YouTube channel and stuff. So I think that's really cool. Like he's trying to be a social MLB player. He likes to have fun on the field, which like baseball definitely lacks. I'm okay with it. I'm really cool with it. I used to be a little bit of like the old school thinking of if he's going to pimp a home run, he's going to get one in the teeth, you know, the next pitch. Mm -hmm. But now the more and more I've been watching, like it really is fun. And like thinking about me as a player, if I were to ever made it like that far, I'm like, Oh yeah, I would have been doing that stuff a hundred (laughs) percent. Like, because I love just like, it's not even like showing it up, but it's like, hell yeah. Like I just crushed that ball. Like, let's go. Like I, I was a big hype guy. So I'm cool with it. I even remember like watching like Jose Reyes when I was younger and like sliding into third base. And as he's sliding, he had like his hands up with his thumb, like tongue out. I'm like, that's, that's fun. I like it. If you're a young fan, I think you gravitate towards those players and baseball needs that. I think, I mean, the, the earliest rendition of a pimp tone run that I can remember is was Sammy Sosa's the, the, the two hop. Or whatever. even, even go back to like Ricky Henderson, Ricky Henderson was pimping home. <laughs> he came, came out here doing the shoulder thing and, flipping the bat no one really remembers it because you know it was a long time ago but he was kind of like the first to really do it if anybody i mean i feel like i mean we just saw you know Deion sanders get hired by barstool yeah. uh i can't imagine primetime didn't pimp some home runs in his day he had to have although yeah. I, don't, I don't i don't know how many home runs he was really hitting he was that kind of player but very true maybe more inside the park ones yeah um but okay yeah for me i mean uh, pimping home runs I always thought there was a time and place as always, if you're going to, you know, pimp it in the second week of May, I'm going to be upset about it. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you know, especially in the playoffs, like Jose Bautista's home run, that was 
un you can't watch that and not be a baseball fan. I, I get chills like watching the replay now. And I remember watching that live. Like it was like, you know, college, like during like, you know, it was finals maybe for a semester or whatever it was. And uh I'm just like watching, I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. I'm not even a Blue Jays fan and I'm I'm hype. <laughs> Seriously, like it was if you told me I had to take that punch to the face you got the next year in in Texas. Yeah. To hit, have that moment where yeah. that – I mean, Toronto, those play, guys go nuts. Yeah. And to have that big of a moment, I mean, it, it doesn't get better than that. No. It, it just – to me, it always felt weird when you did it in May or you yeah. did it in June. Like, what are we doing here? And I think I get where you're coming from for sure because it's like it's not the playoffs. It's not the game-winning thing. But, like, also at the same time, I feel like if you're on that guy's team, wouldn't you want a guy who, like – almost values like every at bat every pitch and it's like this shit is important like i'm yeah i think and i think the the other issue we have here um coming from inside the game here is most times guys that do that all the time you know are assholes like they're yeah. not they're like from like when i have guys on my team that do it mm-hmm. no one likes that guy it's not yeah, because yeah. he's gonna home runs it's his personality we don't like him and so now as a player we associate that type of behavior on the field with an asshole. Mm-hmm. So now we're just like, well, screw this guy. Like he must be like them. But then a lot of times you have stories, like you said, where Tim Anderson's a great guy. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a lot of fun doing his social stuff off the field, which is what I, I love to see Marcus Stroman, Tim Anderson, Trevor Bauer. You know, they're not my favorite people. I haven't met them personally actually at all. Um, but, <laughs> but it is, as far as their social stuff, yeah, they're not, it's not my cup of tea, yeah. but at the same time, like we need that in baseball to continue 100%. to grow the game and continue to get people, you know, the next generation on board with the game of baseball. Uh, so I'm happy to hear that. And I think, but I do think that that correlation that guys seeing what those typically those guys typically do in the clubhouse and how they associate them within their head also plays to a role of, well, screw this guy. He's getting one in the back. Yeah. And I feel like I'm, I'm okay with the bat flips too. Cause like if it was a pitcher who strikes out a guy and like yells at him, I'm in on that too. Like anything that's giving me more excitement, like more just like intense moments, I'm all for it. Like even like Soto, when he takes a pitch and he does the little shuffle, oh my I God. love Juan Soto and it bothers <laughs> me so much because he's on the nationals. He's going to kill me for the next 15 years of my life. Mm-hmm. But I just like my dad the other night was talking about like, we got to throw inside, brush him off the plane. I'm like he lives for that. Like he can't, yeah. that's what he wants. He wants you to use your emotion against him and he's just going to hit another homer off. you. He doesn't yeah. care. You need to draw him to sleep. Correct. Well, yes, you, you need, need to draw. You him. can't let him get any emotion into the at bat where he's like, "Oh, let's go, buddy." Yeah, and yeah. I feel like that's almost why he does it. He's like, All right, I, "I gotta get back into yeah. it. I gotta get back into it." Like he's he lives by he lives under that stuff. He loves loves that stuff. And yeah, you gotta draw that guy to sleep. Just throw him change ups all the day. Yeah, and just make him get bored of the at bats. But I, I agree with you. I love. Remember when John Carlos Stanton, you know, went nuts and picked a home run for the guy who was, you know, oh, yeah. Who, off yeah, like fires. Went, yeah, love that. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. love that. Yeah, that is great. fantastic. I completely enjoy that. And you should be able to do that. I also like when pitchers do it. I was never, you know, in big moments I was, obviously there's a lot of emotion, but um, mainly I usually just struck the guys out and walked up the field. I didn't strike <laughs> them out very often. Otherwise I'd still be playing, but that's for another day. Um, but we'll end there. You know, it was, it's an interesting season we have so far. I Definitely. mean, we have also, you know, our realistic picks. I know you picked the Mets, yeah. uh, which I'll give you another opportunity right now to take that back. No taking back. Okay. No taking back. Uh, so we're still picking the second to worst team in the National League East to win the World Series. Yes. Um, I will let go on record as taking the Boston Red Sox pick back. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I'm not that big of a fan. Yeah. So um, I will switch my pick because I like to update my picks so okay. I can be right. Also, Miami still first place. Yeah. What's going on there? The only one game, uh, one game in front of Atlanta now, but still, still. I mean, they're seven and three in their last ten. Still plus kicking. Six. I mean, I'm not picking them to win the World Series. Oh, of course not, no. But um, I picked the Sox. I'm changing my pick to the Dodgers. That okay. run differential, I don't know if they continue that. Yeah, if you're scoring and pitching, it's hard to beat you. Yeah, and they got some nasty pitchers. If you watch the Pitching Ninja on Twitter at all, it's you see, you pretty much all see, you see Dodgers pitchers. See that. And, and one, guy, red... one guy the Red Sox could have had, too, with Gratterall. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> I don't mean, what was it that had, had it going on? Did he have, like, an injury or something like that? that they we... didn't like his physical. And because, like, I mean, it is true. Like, he definitely, I think, has some, like, damage to his arm that he's going to be a reliever. He's never going to be a starter. And I think yeah. the Red Sox wanted a starter. So, well, Were we getting Verdugo at the time? I can't remember. Or was Verdugo I, don't think Verdugo, I don't think Verdugo was part of it. Okay. So, I'm actually – I'm pretty happy with Verdugo right now. He's, yeah. playing, he's playing really well. Um, but, again, that's where we'll leave it. 
Um, we gave you an opportunity to take the Mets back. They, they're not. You're not doing that. I, not yet. I, I mean, not yet. I mean, did, we, did we lose Waka to injury? Yes. Do we literally only have like two starting pitchers that are pitching decently well this year? Yes. But I'm, I'm still in. I'm still in it. You got to believe. That's the saying. Yeah, I do. I hear that. My buddy, shout out AC. He says you got to believe after every tweet. Yep. I, uh, you don't have to. I, I'm telling him all the time. You don't have to believe. I'm it's 24. Actually, I'm 24 years into believing. You ain't stopping me now. It, I mean. It's actually prudent. It's good sense not to believe in this situation. <laughs> but listen. Hey, it's to each their own, right? Yep. Um, until next time, guys, uh, obviously, as always, go see Dra- Draft Nick Mark over on his YouTube channel. Come see mine, uh, you know, Pat Light. And then you know where to find us everywhere else. Um, until next time, guys, see you later. See you.